In this video, I want to continue with the topic of bond parameters or bond features. And the only one that's left out of the list, uh, which is given by your curriculum, is the coupon rate and also the frequency of uh, coupon payments. So I've called this payment frequency. Now, bonds typically come in two varieties when it comes to the uh, way in which the coupon is expressed. Remember, the coupon is that systematic cash flow that is paid from issuer to investors or may be paid. It's not always paid. So um, two or actually three varieties, to be honest. Um, first one is going to be bonds that have a fixed coupon so fixed coupon bonds these are uh, frequently issued by governments municipalities corporations also now fixed coupon bonds um, provide for a uniform payment so the um, as the name suggests um, there's going to be a fixed or uniform payment um, happening with a certain uh, frequency. It could be annually, it could be semi-annually, uh, quarterly, or even monthly from issuer to investors. In a moment, we'll have an opportunity to um, see how we calculate the size of a coupon. Now, um, the second type is going to be floating coupon bonds, which we often refer to, and this is how your curriculum calls them, floating rate notes. Floating rate notes, which basically means bonds that have a floating coupon or a variable coupon. Um, this is often associated with the abbreviation FRN, floating rate notes or FRNs. Now, in, uh, in this case, the coupon rate is going to be provided or expressed as a formula, seeing as it varies uh, from period to period. So the, the essential thing to appreciate here is that we'll need a certain um, benchmark. We call this the MRR. Well, that's at least how your curriculum uh, calls it. This stands for the market reference rate. The market reference rate. MRR and uh, get used to seeing this in, um, in, in the text, in the curriculum, and possibly also in questions. And on top of this, the MRR, we also add an additional component called the credit spread, which will typically be provided in BPSs or basis points. Don't worry, in a moment we'll do a question together that addresses this uh, these concepts with a proper uh, computation. Now, the MRR, the first component, the market reference rate, is equal to the rate at which um, top quality borrowers borrow money. So this is the borrowing stroke lending rate borrowing and lending are two uh, sides of the same relationship at the same debt relationship so the borrowing lending rate for issuers that enjoy top uh, quality or top credit worthiness for issuers with the highest level um, of credit worthiness This typically in most countries would be the government, although um, it's not necessarily the case. Now, in, in some countries, the government is not necessarily the most credit worthy of borrowers, but in many countries, that is indeed uh, the case. So the important thing to appreciate is that the mar market reference rate has nothing to do with the issuer themselves. Uh, for example, if a company is issuing bonds uh, with a floating uh, coupon, a floating rate note, um, the market reference rate is going to be independent of that company and it's going to basically reset periodically. So this resets periodically 
Typically, if, for example, the coupon is paid with a frequency of, let's say, every three months, so every quarter, then the uh, market reference rate would also be reset every uh, quarter, every um, every three months. Um, this obviously means it can go up or down, this market reference rate, causing also <laughs> the coupon um, to accordingly uh, also go up or down in line with what's happening to the market reference rate. In a question that we'll do in just a moment, you will see that I've used the example of the Euribor um, as a um, Europe or Eurozone specific market reference uh, rate. Now, when you take the exam, uh, but also if you look in the curriculum, you may find that the um, examiner doesn't give you a specific name for the market reference rate. They just call it the MRR in which case you don't have to bother thinking about what it actually is. It's just a figure that you need to stick into the um, into the question. Now, let's go over to the right-hand side, the credit spread. This is, on the other hand, going to be issuer-specific. And it's an add-on uh, on top of the market reference rate, which is supposed to reflect. So this reflects the actual um, credit worthiness of the issuer uh, reflects issuer's credit worthiness, meaning their quality, uh, how trustworthy they are, credit worthiness. Okay, good. Um, poor quality, you could say. Now, Obviously, issuers with a high quality, good financial condition, uh, which obviously also um, means that there is a big high probability that they'll be able to make the promised payments on their bonds. They typically issue bonds where the uh, credit spread is relatively low, or close to zero, given the fact that the highest quality issuer is typically the government uh, simply can borrow at the MRR without any credit spread um, added to this. Um, now, what's also important is that typically this stays constant over the life of the bond. Constant over the life of the uh, bond or the note, so it doesn't adjust. This is the adjusting bit, the variable bit. This stays constant. And obviously, if the quality of the issuer subsequently changes once the bond has been issued, this may lead to certain price fluctuations, given the fact that the credit spread which was put in place at the time of issuance may not adequately um, any longer reflect the quality of the issuer once it changes up or down. Okay, but that's a topic for um, later later modules. It will come up later on. Now we also have a third type of coupon rate, although you could say it's a, it's a specific example of a fixed coupon, namely a zero coupon bond. So especially governments um, often issue bonds with a zero coupon, meaning they don't pay coupons at all, um, in which case, you know, there's no periodic interest payments. Such bonds are typically issued um, below their nominal value, their par value face value, principal value. So you buy them at a discount to their nominal value. And your reward for holding such a bond to maturity is the fact that at the end of the bond's life, you get the full nominal value. That's when you kind of receive the interest on the bond, but there is no systematic cash flow over its, um, over its time to maturity. Okay, time for some questions now. So I'm going to clear the board and make space for uh, two exam style questions exploring the computation of coupons of a fixed nature as well as of a floating nature. So let's press ahead with the actual questions. This is the first one uh, focusing on a fixed coupon bond. If a $1,000 par value government bond, which is currently trading at a price of $980, pays a 4.5% coupon with semi-annual frequency, the size of the semi-annual coupon payment is closest to and three options follow as in the CFA exam. 
Um, right, so over here you've got a little bit too much information um, as compared to what is actually needed. For example, this info on the, yeah, here it is, on the price at which the bond is trading, the $980. That's completely irrelevant to the question because the size of a coupon payment doesn't um, depend on the current price of a bond. It's a function of the uh, coupon rate, this 4.5%, and the uh, par value uh, or principal value. So um, essentially what we need to do is take, and obviously also the frequency of payments. Now, the, the thing to really, really um, emphasize here is that when you are given a coupon rate, whatever it is, um, in this case, it was 4.5%, this is always um, per annum. Um, it's always quoted on a yearly basis, irrespective of the actual coupon payment frequency, this will be given on a per annum, per year basis. So um, the size of the coupon, but critically the annual coupon is going to be whatever that number is, 4.5% multiplied by the nominal value or principal value or par value um, of the bond. So principal value, which um, in this case was $1,000. Um, Good. Uh, which obviously comes in at uh, $45 doesn't it? Now, the um, only thing that remains is to compute the size of the semi-annual coupon, given the fact that these coupons are paid once every six months. And uh, you don't really need a calculator for, for this, do you? It, you just divide this uh, number by two uh, to get 22 and a half um, every six months. And that obviously becomes the answer to the question it's going to be answer um b over here that's the that's the one that's the correct one okay time for the second question this one's going to be on um, floating rate notes variable coupon uh, bonds a corporate um frn floating rate note currently trading at a price of 101.2 now once again the price is irrelevant and just just you know bear in mind that when you're given a price like here 101.2 what that price actually means is not 101.2 dollars euros or something like that it's actually uh, quoted as a percentage of principal, everything to do with bonds, like the coupon rate, but also the price at which a bond trades is going to be um, expressed as a percentage of principal value or face value or par value. So if in the second half of the sentence we're told it has a face value of 1,000, if you were to calculate its price, you would need to take 101.2% of 1,000, which would give you 1,012. Okay, as I said, that's not really the point. Um, the bond pays a quarterly coupon at a rate of um, equal to three-month Euribor plus 28 BPS. So Euribor, three-month Euribor would be our market reference rate, uh, 28 basis points, each basis point being 100 for the percent. Um, so this is 0.28% is effectively the credit spread that we add above the MRR. If the free month fury ball rate applicable to the current quarter is 3.98%, the size of the coupon payable for the period is closest to. Um, right, this isn't difficult, but once again, you have to bear in mind the fact that we have to scale things down to a quarter, whereas everything uh, provided like Yuri Bohr, even though it says three month Yuri Bohr, it's actually an annualized rate. <laughs> you, know, you know, get used to the fact that in finance, we annualize pretty much everything. So um, the coupon um, rate is um, three month Yuri Bohr, the MRR plus 2.90, sorry, um, plus uh, 28 basis points here. So 0.28%. That's what we um, mean by basis points. Uh, one hundredth of a percent is one basis point. Now, for this, we need to plug in 3.98%. Um, yes, that's it. 
Um, so maybe now I'm going to use my calculator um, as to um, avoid making a mistake. So uh, 3.98 plus 0 0.28, that's going to give a result of 4.26%. But this is once again per annum. And um, we need to turn this into a quarterly number, don't we? So um, actually, maybe before I even do that, uh, let me multiply, as always, by the principal amount. Um, be careful, don't multiply ever by the current price. The only time when you'd use the current price is if you were doing something like a current yield computation, which is something I'll show you in a moment. Um, that's to do not with computing the coupon size, but the yield, the rate of return on the bond. Uh, you'll see that in a moment. 4.26 times 1,000, that's obviously uh, 42.6 um, uh, euros once again per annum per year. But we need to turn this into a quarterly figure. So wait, 42.60, but divide this by four. Yeah, because uh, this bond pays um, coupons with a uh, quarterly uh, frequency, so 10.65 euros in respect of the uh, current quarter in which we are observing that specific Euribor. So the answer here would be answer um, answer A. And let me just stress that with um, FRNs, with floating rate notes, what you would do every quarter is take an updated reading of um, the MRR. In this case, it's the three-month Euribor. Um, and plug that into the formula, do all these workings, and you would get a fresh current coupon. So it's not as if this coupon stays fixed for the for the whole year and gets paid at 10.65 four times in a row, and then something else comes in. No, we, we update this every quarter. So even though we say per annum per year here, it's only for the purposes of computing the quarterly coupon, which changes every three months as we get an updating reading of three month fury bond. Okay, so I want to finish this uh, video off with a quick look at some very basic yield measures, seeing as these are also talked about in your curriculum in this section of the of the book. So just two uh, very quick um, yield measures. The first one's going to be the current yield, and then we're going to have uh, the yield to maturity. But please be aware of the fact that um, there will be more on these yield measures in um, subsequent sections of uh, of uh, the curriculum as well. They will be expanded on. So here it's just a very brief look. For some reason, the um, authors of the curriculum decided to already uh, put some knowledge about this uh, at this very early stage. So the current yield is an expression that takes into account the annual coupon, right? Not quarterly, not semi-annual, but whatever is the annual coupon. So the full one that you get by taking the coupon rate and multiplying by uh, principal value. And you divide, and this time, this is where you divide by the actual bond price. Whatever it is, and this is where the price actually uh, comes in handy as opposed to principal value. And um, obviously, if the bond price goes up, the yield or the current yield on the bond decreases as as you would expect with any rate of return on an investment. So um, if you get a question on this, um, you know, you have to make sure you're plugging in both numbers consistently. So um, if you're if you've got a coupon rate, then over here, you should have a bond price expressed as a percentage of nominal value. So like, you know, 4.65 here. Um, of nominal value, 4.65%, and over here, bond price, maybe 101.2% of nominal value, or you could go just as just as well with both the numerator and denominator being expressed in uh, monetary units like euros or uh, dollars, but you have to be consistent. And the second one uh, that you already need to know about, and there will be plenty more on this to come, is the yield to maturity. known as the yield to maturity, known as the YTM.
M. You'll be doing plenty of computations on this using your calculators later on. And this is, um, realistically, the internal rate of return or the IRR, something that you'll um, also be learning about, for example, in the corporate um, issuers uh, section of the, of the curriculum. IRR, internal rate of return on the um, on the bond investment, so of the bond investment. But very critically, assuming um, you know that it is held until maturity, so you go all the way to receive on the maturity date the full principal value of the bond back. Um, so IRR of bond investment, meaning it's kind of the rate of return experienced by the bond investor, but already I want you to be aware of certain limitations here, certain conditions that need to hold true in order for this to really be a good measure of the rate of return as experienced by the bond investors. First of all, um, in order for this to be the case, in order for the IRR to be the good representation of that yield or rate of return experienced by the investor, we have to assume that um, the bond is obviously held to maturity. That's kind of contained in the name. The bond is held to maturity. In other words, it's not sold uh, before the maturity date, in which case it can be sold for an unknown price. The thing about holding the bond until maturity is you know how much you will get at the maturity date because that's given by the principal value or the principal amount of the bond. The second point is, um, well, we have to assume that all the payments, all the contractual payments on the bond, meaning coupons, um, but also principal value at the end, are received in full and on time. So um, there are no delinquencies, there are no defaults um, in full um, and on time. And the third point, which is kind of the most technical point, and it's something very critical that you may get asked about in the exam, both um, in terms of the fixed income section of the curriculum, but also the corporate issuers where IRR, internal rate of return, is a sort of bigger topic, is that all the payments that you receive throughout the life of the bond, so the coupons received, the interim payments before the maturity date, are reinvested at a rate equal to the YTM, the yield to maturity. So an IRR, which is what the YTM essentially is, only holds true if you, re re if you reinvest all the inter you know, intermittent um, um, cash flows at the same rate of investment as the yield to maturity, which isn't necessarily always possible, but it is a critical assumption of this measure. Now, we are not going to do any computations of the YTM here. We'll do so um, in a subsequent section of the, of the, of the, of the, of the video course. But um, this is something which your curriculum lays out at this very early stage, so I wanted to, to get this down, and probably in the future I'll reference it anyway. So, um, one final thing. We've got the Currently, we've got the yield to maturity, and let's just press ahead with this topic a little bit to introduce the concept of the yield curve, which, once again, your curriculum talks, at, talks about at this very early stage. So what's the yield curve? The yield curve is basically a um, graphical way to represent or to show the yields um, to maturity of bonds coming from the same issuer, but with different maturities. So maybe I'll, I'll write this down. It's a graphical representation of the um, yield to maturities, YTMs, of various issues
bond issues, obviously, but from the same issuer, critically, uh, of various bond issues from same issuer, but with uh, different tenors, meaning different times to maturity. So the, the, the classic way to represent this is as follows, is to, to, to draw a graph on which um, on the vertical axis you'd have the actual YTM, the yield to maturity, and over here you'd have the, the tenors, the time remaining to maturity. And for different mature, sorry, maturity, and for different bond issues you would plot their time remaining to maturity, you know, maybe one year, two years, uh, three years, and so on, and how much yield you know, we get given, uh, you know, the, the IRR computation. So um, thanks to this, you'd be able to, to, to plot certain points on this chart. And what I'm going to do is, is draw a an, what's called a an upward... <laughs> didn't come out great, but um, it's an upward sloping yield curve, which is considered to be normal. Um, however, it's just as possible that in reality, you would experience a downward sloping or you'd see a downward sloping yield curve in the economy. And uh, in later sections of the videos, we'll, we'll talk about how to interpret the yield curve, what theories allow us to um, gain insights into why this is happening, why this shape is uh, a certain way or another. However, um, upwards, uh, an upward sloping yield curve like the one I've just drawn, upward sloping yield curve, which is considered to be a relatively normal phenomenon, means that investors um, expect to get higher returns as expressed by the YTM, for holding bonds that have a longer maturity. So the longer the maturity time to maturity, the more they expect to get out of them, the, the higher the return. Uh, and another point is that typically what you would plot is a government yield curve. Um, obviously on the basis of YTM computations done, with government bonds, but also you could plot a yield curve coming uh, fr uh, using bonds coming from a corporate issuer. And the normal thing to experience or to expect is that if you have a corporate issuer uh, and, or a corporate issuer yield curve, those yields should be a little bit higher than uh, those uh, plotted on the basis of government uh, bonds because of the extra uh, sort of um, risk associated with buying corporate bonds. See this, this, this area here, the additional yield is due to the extra risk posed by uh, corporate issuers as opposed to government issuers who are supposed to be typically the highest sort of quality out there. So um, yeah, I think that's enough. I've covered pretty much everything that's, that the curriculum talks about with respect to coupons. Um, coupon rates, coupon structures, payment frequencies, but also basic yield measures.